Today's presentation is Scrofula Doctor and Musical Genius, How One Woman Healed Body and Soul in Post-Civil War South. Our presenter is David Hirsch, uh, MM, MLS, Associate Professor and Head of the ECU Music Library, and he's been at ECU for about 14 years. Thank you, Melissa. Very nice to be here today talking about something that's become very important to me over the last decade. Um, Alice is a special person. I think you'll find out why I became sort of absorbed with her. Today I will introduce you to colorful North 19th century North Carolina patent medicine entrepreneur and folk musician Alice Morgan Person, or Mrs. Joe Person as she was known professionally. As an introduction to the life of this remarkable woman, I will read the first paragraph of the introduction to my biography of Alice, which was published in 2009 by McFarland Publishing. This reading will serve to place Alice within the context of U.S. history and give some idea of how that history poised her to contribute to the histories of folk music, patent medicine, and women in business. Life in the post-Civil War South was difficult. The atrocities of war, the loss of loved ones and personal property, and the arduous task of rebuilding the economy intensified physical infirmities untouched by mid-19th century medical practice. These circumstances drove Southerners to seek ways to heal both body and soul. The passionate search of one Southerner, Mrs. Joe Alice Person, resulted in a unique combination of medicine and music, a synthesis that became the hallmark of a remarkable life that would not soon be forgotten. Indeed, nearly 100 years after Alice's death, her descendants enthusiastically claim her as an example of what women can accomplish in the face of adversity. This familial enthusiasm was the impetus for the publication of this book. We are fortunate today to have with us a representative of the familial enthusiasm to which I refer here. His name is Harry Stubbs, and he is a great-great-grandson of Alice Person, and the one who brought Alice to my attention. In 2000, Harry uh, came to me in my job as the head of the music library here at ECU, and he had the two pieces of music that you see right here, um, which he had found in his father's attic after his father had passed away, and he had heard stories of his great-great-grandmother Alice. and. Um, initially thought he would just throw this music out, but after recalling those stories that he had heard, he thought maybe the music library at ECU would be interested, and he brought them in. I was very interested. I did a little research. There were only two things published on her, and they were very small um, and, and brief, I should say, and um, one of them uh, was a, uh, a work, a, a journal article discussing one of the pieces of music that he had brought to me um, by an ethnomusicologist who later became my co-author for the book. And um, I del um, having found that and that alone, I thought this is ripe for research. And as uh, librarians at ECU are faculty members and therefore must publish or perish, and I, I dug right in and um, ended up having a wonderful time uh, find meeting a lot of interesting people. And in fact, one of those other family members, another great-great-grandson, um, nearing the, as I neared the end of my research, I received a call from him saying that he heard I was writing her story and that he had two large boxes of her business records and travel journals in one of his barns in Wake County, North Carolina. I was thrilled, of course, to get those things. And uh, included in there were 13 uh, travel journals from the last 13 years of her life. I knew where she had been every day and what she had done right up until her death, which was an amazing thing. I was able to convince um, Mr. Boyce, the, the great-great-grandson, to donate those things to the special collections at ECU, and they all sit there. Some of, some of these things are sitting up here for you to look at afterwards as well. In today's lecture, I will provide you with an overview of Alice's life, a discussion of her musical activity, and a discussion of her patent medicine and its place in pharmaceutical history. Alice Morgan Person was born and raised in Petersburg, Virginia. She relocated to Franklin County, North Carolina, after her December 1857 marriage to Joseph Arrington Person, a member of a wealthy Central North Carolina family. As you probably know, there is a Person County in North Carolina. There is a Person Avenue that runs in front of the Capitol Building in Raleigh. All of these things are named after this family. A few Our weeks. Also a person <laughs> Hall in Chapel Hill. 
that's true, that's true. <laughs> a few years later, the couple's happy life was abruptly interrupted when Joseph's debilitating stroke, I might add that he was 26 years older than Alice, so therefore he was suffering a stroke when she was still quite young, uh, and the Civil War surrender of the South left them with no way to support their young family. For several years, the couple provided for their growing family by selling the land that Joseph was unable to farm. During this time, one of their young daughters became ill with scrofula, a type of tuberculosis that was common before milk was pasteurized. On the night the local physician gave up hope for the child's survival, a neighbor woman came by to offer help in the form of a remedy that was given to her father by a local Indian. Alice was skeptical, but could see no harm in trying the medicine if it offered any hope at all of saving her child. Alice and her neighbor gathered the ingredients from the woods, prepared a batch of the concoction, and gave it to the child throughout the night. By morning, the child's condition had improved, and in three weeks, she was cured. As her family's land and money slowly dwindled, Alice continued to prepare the remedy and share it with friends who were ill, never ceasing to be amazed by its positive effect on a number of health problems. Alice's faith in the remedy soon became a calling, and one which also offered a cure for her family's ailing financial situation. With this in mind, she began her mission by marketing the remedy in the nearby city of Raleigh. Though she met with some resistance from the Raleigh medical community, Alice persisted and headed for Charlotte, Tarboro, and other North Carolina cities. With time, the remedy proved itself and attracted a faithful following of satisfied customers. The promise of quick profits also attracted several unscrupulous investors and partners. Though it was not easy, Alice was always able to pull herself out of these situations and to maintain the remedy's solid reputation. As with her remedy, Alice felt a strong devotion to the power of music. She initially viewed her piano playing as something for the enjoyment of her family and friends. However, a visit to the, to the Raleigh Exposition, predecessor to the North Carolina State Fair, transformed it into much more. While there, some of Alice's friends asked her to play a few of her infectious southern tunes on one of the pianos on display at a piano's, piano dealer's exhibit. She did and soon attracted a large gathering of fairgoers. The piano dealer was so delighted by the attention she brought to his display that he hired her to play at future exhibits. This opportunity led to several similar engagements in cities like Atlanta and Dallas. Eventually, people asked Alice to publish her arrangements so they could play them at home. She did and delighted in the fact that she now had three friends that brought her near to the people while adding to her income, her remedy, her playing, and her music. Alice continued to produce and market the remedy along with her piano playing and sheet music until the age of 70, thus becoming known for her good medicine and good music throughout the South. As indicated in the title of today's presentation, Alice was considered by some to be a musical genius. Her visit to Knoxville, Tennessee on a trip, a return trip from playing at an exposition in Dallas, Texas, resulted in the Knoxville Sentinel reporting that she was a unique musical genius and providing the following description of her performance style. Her style of performance is extremely novel, her touch remarkably vigorous and exact, heavy yet sympathetic. Her repertoire is composed almost exclusively of old anti-war time melodies and songs. A Sentinel reporter listened with delight to several irresistibly captivating airs which she kindly gave for his benefit on a sweet-toned courtsman in MacArthur's music store yesterday afternoon. The numbers were ex executed with an earnestness of expression which rendered them all the more fascinating. Mrs. Person, whose manner is charmingly unaffected and cordial, made quite a number of friends during her brief visit to the city. In addition to being a musical genius, Alice was a genius at intertwining her musical and medical products to best advantage. When she played for expositions, her terms of agreement with the piano vendors for whom she played included permission to display and sell her patent medicine. In this way, Alice used her music to draw a crowd to which she could later pitch the medicine in her unaffected and cordial manner. Conversely, Alice's business model relied on paying all production and promotion costs associated with the medicine with the proceeds from the sale of her sheet music. In this way, all income from the sale of the medicine was profit. Although Alice's performing repertoire consisted of at least 52 tunes, she chose just 18 of them for inclusion in her published repertoire. These were divided between two collections, one containing 15 tunes and the other just three. Now we'll look at a few of these examples and um, we will also um, 
listen to some of them as well. As I said earlier, these are the two pieces that um, Harry Stubbs brought to me. This one contains 15 pieces. This one contains just three. And below them, I have two other uh, variants on the, on the covers, which due to a number of other family members who came forth who had, who had inherited these things, um, I was able to acquire for the special collections at Joyner. Um, the lower one here is, is the, I believe, to be the first edition. This picture here is the one that you saw in my opening slide. It would have been done from that cabinet card that we saw in the opening slide. And it lists all the pieces right here on the sheet music. I want to point out also why I think it was the first edition. It's because in the, the title of the second piece, Weird Waltz and Polka, the word weird is misspelled. However, later on the piece that Harry gave me, that was corrected. And it was also corrected inside the music place on the inside of the, of the sheet music. I think that Alice ran out of her copies of sheet music and took advantage of a second printing to correct the problem. And then this selection here starts out with a very long piece, um, the Blue Alsatian Mountains, and has two shorter ones that go with it. As was typical, and we're going to listen to a little bit, um, Alice knew what she was doing. She knew that she had to appear to be respect, a respectable woman. I think that's why she chose Mrs. Joe Person as her professional name. Number one, she was married. Number two, Joe was a nice common name that everyone would probably relate to and feel very much at home around her. But one of those things in keeping with her properness would be that she would open each of these collections with a more European style classical sounding piece. And then she would move on from there to some more raucous fun pieces such as dance pieces and of course Dixie was in there. Let's look at, have a little look at that now. The first piece here is, as I just said, Italian waltz. And so again, we, we, we take us to the old country right there with Italy. And it's a waltz, which would make her uh, show that she was a proper woman. And this is what it sounds like. yet sympathetic style of playing. The playing here is by a retired uh, piano professor, Charles Bath. He recorded these 10 years ago for us to put in the digital exhibit that uh, we'll talk about a little later. I think he did a beautiful job. particular piece, it's interesting to note that my co-author, Dr. Chris Gertzen from the University of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg, um, has never seen, he, he's an ethnomusicologist and a folk art specialist, so he was uniquely um, qualified to write about both uh, the music and the medicine. Um, he has never seen this piece anywhere written down except here, and he believes it to be something that would have been learned by ear, and be, Alice unknowingly gave us a snapshot of that piece in history because something that is learned by oral tradition migrates and varies over time. Little, little tones begin to change before you know it, you've got something different going on. You can usually trace it back to its roots, but um, he's only ever heard it played um, by fiddlers in the mountains of North Carolina and Virginia who have learned it by ear passed down over generations. 
which is probably how Al Alice learned it. She would have been trained as a young Southern woman to play the piano, but was not a, a trained musician. She was not able to actually put these notes to paper. She had to play them for two days for a man while he wrote them, transcribed them down onto paper so she could publish them. Okay, and let's listen to one more piece here yet. And here, of course, she wrote somewhere in one of her um, memoirs, one of her a scrap of paper, something somewhere, I remember reading, um, when I got to Dixie, I had them. <laughs> because... The story is she played that, she played Dixie between every song at the exposition because that's how she drew the crowd in. Once she got there, and I don't even know what page it is here, uh, it would take a while to find that, but... Um, she, she would put it later on in, in her line of pieces, and at that point, she was hearkening back to the good old days before the war. That was what her music was all about. That's how she appealed. You hear some of these motifs like that right there. Uh, she was imitating a banjo, probably, in a lot of these things. She would have grown up um, seeing the uh, uh, blackface minstrelsy and, and um, adapting her and arranging things in a way that sounded like a banjo or something that she would have heard at one of those shows. And it's Billy in the Low Ground that's the one that's never been written down, correct? No, no, it's the Italian Waltz. Yes. Oh, that's the one. That's uh, yeah, right. She, she wrote, wrote that one down. Yeah, I'm sure Billy in the Low Ground has been uh, written down. Okay, let's get out of that. All right. Now we'll turn to the part of Alice's healing career that is the focus of today's lecture, the medicine. To begin our discussion of the medicine, we'll have a look at some of the bottles that held, and in some cases still hold, Alice's precious elixir. Okay, the, uh, let me point out here, the bottle that you see in this picture here, which is from the collection of Don and Gary Coonard in Lewisburg, North Carolina, is the earliest bottle that I know of. It's unique in that the other three bottles that I, I have, that I know of, one which is sitting right up here, which is actually from the Country Doctor Museum collection, um, and the other two have paper labels affixed to a, a plain glass jar or, or bottle. This one, however, as you can see, the name of the remedy was blown into the glass, and in that, for that reason, it's fairly rare. Mrs. Joe Person's remedy, Tarboro, North Carolina. This would only have been produced between uh, a April of 1885 and, and April of 1886. She was only there for one year. And then next in line, the next oldest bottle I would think, I would suppose, all right, would be this one right here. Uh, it's a pre-1904 bottle because when I, I, have ex I have examined the bottle and I also blew up the, uh, I can, you know, using the, the zoom feature, I was able to blow the picture up and, and see that it has, it indicates that it was made in Kittrell, North Carolina, and she lived in Kittrell up until 1904, so I know it was probably made somewhere in that time period, but after Tarboro, um, because she settled in Kittrell after Tarboro. And then the bottle that we have over here, which is from the Country Doctor Museum, by looking at it, I see that it indicates Charlotte, North Carolina, and um, she did not move to Charlotte until 1904, and it does not contain the list of ingredients which would have been required by the 1906 Food and Drug Act. So therefore, I'm, I'm gonna suppose that this was, was produced during the two-year period between 1904 and 1906. And then the final, the oldest bottle that I know of is this one right here, which I hope to acquire for the Country Doctor Museum. I know the couple that owns this bottle. They actually live in the house that Alice lived in when she first began making this remedy. It sits, it overlooks the Tar River, uh, which I think is interesting that it runs, that, that river runs right through Greenville as well, where the author of this book lives. And um, on US 1, as you go north out of Raleigh, Capitol Boulevard becomes US 1, and uh, her home sits there overlooking the Tar River. The people that live there own this bottle, as you can see, just like the one from the Country Doctor Museum. It is full of, of the remedy right there. These two older bottles, they, they sealed them much better. There's a wax seal, so, so the cork did not dry out and fall in. The other bottles that I've seen, that 
In fact, in the bottom of this bottle, you, there is a piece of the cork. This bottle, however, is, coming, is dating from later than 1939 because on the bottle it indicates that it has, they began to use new packaging in 1939. The remedy only continued to sell until about 1945, so uh, it, it's going to date within a few years in that range, 1940, 1945. It also lists a complete list of the ingredients, and it's right here along the bottom, which the Food and Drug Act of 1906 would have required her to do. Of course, the first thought that comes to mind when a home remedy is mentioned is whether it is more alcoholic beverage than medicine. In the case of Alice's remedy, it was indeed 20% alcohol, whiskey to be precise, and she's got that in bold lettering, but she's going to let you know, right there it is, right there. Um, Certainly, if an individual drank enough of Alice's remedy, they would become drunk. And for certain problems, Alice actually did recommend on the oldest label, which is this one right here, I read this label, and it does say to take it every 15 minutes until the effect is felt in the head. <laughs> this directive was, however, removed from later bottle labels, and Alice even indicated in her published advertisements, a few of which are sitting here on the table for you to look at afterwards, that a person had taken too much if they felt the effect of the alcohol. It's kind of interesting there. She changed her, her theory there a little later on. In actuality, the alcohol served as a preservative and aided in eliciting the active ingredients from the medicine's botanical ingredients. Medicines that combined alcohol and herbs in this way were called bitters. In the case of Alice's bitters, the herbal ingredients were as follows. Pipsisua, queen's root, Mexican sarsaparilla, prickly ash bark, star grass, halonius, and trillium. And if I'm a gardener and I love growing things and I know a number of these things and they are native wildflowers from, that would be native in most of North Carolina, if not all. We will examine these ingredients more closely in just a bit, but let's first consider what the remedy was aimed at curing. As the title of my lecture suggests, it was aimed at curing scrofula, the disease from which Alice's daughter Josie was supposedly suffering when a neighbor offered Alice the remedy. Having existed for thousands of years, scrofula, or tuberculous cervical adenitis, is considered to be one of the oldest diseases in the world. As I indicated earlier, it is a form of tuberculosis spread via infected cow's milk and is still known in areas where milk is not pasteurized. While pulmonary tuberculosis affects the lungs, scrofula inflames the glands of the neck, causing painful, separating sores. The neighbor who offered the medicine's recipe to Alice claimed that it was infallible for scrofula, and that claim was borne out in Josie's seemingly miraculous cure. Alice tested the remedy by sharing it with neighbors and encouraging them to try it for other maladies and eventually found it to be effective for the following additional ailments, catter, rheumatism, skin cancer in its early stages, heart disease, erysipelas, indigestion, chronic bilious colic, eruptions, and skin diseases. Um, Many of these names didn't even sound familiar to us, of course. <laughs> um, but we must keep in mind that late 19th century medicine was not particularly sophisticated, and misdiagnosis was far more common than today because doctors could only diagnose based on symptoms. There were no blood tests that could look for unique characteristics that verified the chemical presence of a specific medicinal, medical problem. For this reason, this list of illnesses for which Alice's medicine was effective could actually have been longer or shorter. And then there is the question of whether it was even effective for curing anything. That's a question we will consider later, but now let's take a closer look at the ingredients. As I stated earlier, Alice claimed she learned how to make the medicine from a neighbor woman, who learned how to make it from her father, who learned how to make it from a local Indian. For this reason, the co-author of my book consulted these sources for information on Native American botanicals when researching the ingredients. We have it. Um, Hutchins, Indian Herbology in North America, Vogel's American Indian Medicine, and Mormon's Native American Ethnobotany. The following two slides provide the information gleaned from these books with regard to the exact scientific names of the plants Alice referred to <coughs> on her label by their common names, as well as the Native American uses for each that match Alice's uses. The underlying uses are those of the Cherokee tribe, which was the closest to the various places in which Alice lived. As you can see here, Helonius, uh, Camelarium luteum, 
um, skin ulcers and tonic and coughs, and the underlined or the Cherokee uses. Um, we also have Pipsisua, Chymophila umbulata or maculata, and there's scrofula right there. That's what the Indians used it for, alterative, rheumatism, etc. Prickly ash bark, Xanthoxylum americanum, again there's scrofula. Queen's root, Stellingia sylvatica, again scrofula, indigestion. Mexican sarsaparilla, which could have been either one of two things, Aurelia nudicalis or Smilex herbacea. Um, and again here, they, they, they both have very similar things for which they were used, again scrofula, and these various things you see here. Stargrass, Electris farinosa, scrofula is right up there in, in a lot of these. <laughs> and trillium, here we see what, what that did. Here's the alcohol. Um, this part of the ingredients shows white influence because the Indians did not use alcohol to, to mix things together. They used, tended to use things separately. Um, may, perhaps the Indians did begin doing that, but it was only after that was introduced to them probably by people from Europe. Okay. Docs, Dr. Gertzen was also able to determine that all of these species are native to the North Carolina locales in which Alice lived throughout her life, these locales being Franklin County, Edgecombe County, and Mecklenburg County. This and the fact that Alice's uses for her remedy match the Native American uses supports my belief and that of Dr. Gertzen that Alice was truthful about the origin of the remedy and also that she genuinely believed in it. Alice did not produce and market a product she knew to be ineffective. In other words, she was not a huckster. There is, however, the matter of whether the medicine was truly effective. To shed some light on this matter, my co-author turned to current research on these botanicals as reported in the medical research journal literature. Here are some highlights of what he found. Pipsisawa has antioxidant and antifungal properties. Prickly ash bark shows potential as an antifungal and antibacterial and also for some gynecological uses. Sarsaparilla, Smilax herbacea, not the Aurelia nudicalis, exhibits potential as an anti-cancer agent, helps with psoriasis, may help attenuate inflammation caused by autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis and a kind of gout, might help with AIDS, and even has as an effect, even has an effect on mycobacteria such as the one that causes tuberculosis. However, when discussing herbal medicines produced in the way that Alice produced hers, we must keep in mind the fact that several factors affected the potency of each dose. These factors include, one, the conditions under which the herbs grew, two, the inconsistency of hand preparation, and three, the relatively weak dilutions of an herb's various elements, whether good or bad, in hand-prepared medicines. With these things in mind, we can confidently state that taking Alice's remedy would certainly not have done any harm and may even have done some good, even if it wasn't quite infallible for scrofula. In order to understand why, even with the weaknesses I just pointed out, Alice's patent medicine would have been successful and for 75 years, we need to look at the state of mid and late 19th century medicine. In the middle of the 19th century, medicine was still based on the concept of the early Greek theory of balance among the four humors, yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood, and included painful and dangerous treatments such as bloodletting, either by surgical incisions or the application of leeches to human flesh, purging, dehydration, and the ingestion of nasty mineral medicines. As we now know, all of these treatments lower the ability of the human body to heal itself and more often left the patient worse off or even dead. Herbal medicines, on the other hand, were far less threatening, and people were anxious to try them. True, by the late 19th century, doctors were vaccinating for smallpox, did some surgeries quite well, set broken bones, alleviated some pain with drugs, and had reasonable success with indigestion and some kinds of poisoning. Nonetheless, the lingering memories of earlier practices made patent medicines very attractive. Judging from the dozens of letters from satisfied customers recorded in Alice's advertising literature, and as I said earlier, so that's up here that you can have a look at later on, Alice's medicine was certainly more effective than contemporary medical practice. It is, of course, possible that other coincidental factors resulted in the cures related in these letters. And then there is the matter of whether the letters were genuine. While researching my book, I did find one testimonial letter among the pages of one of Alice's journals, which indicates she did indeed receive such letters. Let's have a look at that letter. I call it the lone surviving testimonial letter. We're going to go and 
open that up. Here's the first page. Um, I have a little girl, nine years of age, who has had white swelling for six years, has been in the hospital in Charleston, South Carolina, Richmond, Virginia, had four operations performed on her. She was well till about two months ago, and the trouble returned. Her leg inflamed and bursted in four different places. We called the doctors. I just want to read the whole thing so you get an idea of what these people were dealing with. Uh, and how desperate they were in some cases. He treated her for about two weeks, she growing steadily worse all the time, uh, having high fever all the time, had one hemorrhage, wounds would discharge about a pint per day, was in bed all the time, could not walk a step. Pieces of bone would work out as before. The doctor said the leg would have to be amputated. I would not consent, my wife had been taking your medicine and prevailed on me to try it on the little one. Up to the present time, she has taken nine bottles. Whew. She is now out of, ooh, out of her bed. In about two weeks after we commenced using your medicine, she got up out of her bed and could walk with crutches. About a week ago, she discarded her crutches at this writing, her leg is not swelled at all. Discharges have almost ceased. She has gained about 35 pounds in weight. Just as hardy as she can be, if there is any information you can give me on this case or any suggestions. Uh, you may offer us, will be appreciated. Yours very respectfully, E.F. Kelly. I sometimes wonder if we have this one letter because it deals with a nine-year-old girl. Perhaps Alice gave it pride of place in one of her journals because this girl was the same age as her daughter Josie when the remedy precipitated an equally dramatic recovery from an equally bleak condition. Many of the letters in, in the printed advertisements that Alice published had a theme similar to this one. Multiple recurrences of an unusual health problem, multiple doctors, and multiple surgeries, followed by healing after the use of Mrs. Joe Person's remedy as a replacement for the painful options offered by the medical community. One final aspect of this fascinating woman's career that we must consider is the fact that she was successful in arenas that were at one time the undisputed territory of men. Few women engaged in the 19th century patent medicine trade, and only one rose to national prominence. That would be Lydia E. Pinkham of Pinkham's Vegetable Compound fame. Are any of you familiar with that name? You, when, you go, when you look back into old um, newspapers and things, her, her advertisements are all over the place. Chris Gertzen and I cannot help but wonder whether Alice's medicine might have risen to national fame as well if factors beyond the quality of her product and her character had been more favorable. There are amazing similarities between these two women. Number one, they had a similar level of education. Two, they entered the patent medicine trade after their husbands lost the ability to provide for their families. Three, they acquired the recipe for their medicine secondhand, Alice from a neighbor who got it from a Native American, and Lydia from her husband who received it from a debtor in lieu of money. Um, the fourth similarity, both medicines focused on one main health problem, Alice's on scrofula, as we've heard, and Lydia's on female complaints. Uh, number five, they both had children join them in business as partners. Alice, um, Alice had one son, and he is the one who kept that medicine going until the 1945 uh, into the mid-1940s after she passed away in 1913. Um, there are differences as well. The difference be between the two women were also the factors that advanced Lydia and limited Alice. These factors include one, location. Alice was located in the war-torn south and Lydia in the densely populated and thriving northeast. Lydia Pink Pinkham lived in Lynn, Massachusetts. Two, the presence or lack of early profits. Lydia's superb location resulted in, in unusually large initial profits, which allowed Pinkham to advertise more widely than Alice. And third um, difference, number of business partners. Lydia had three sons who desired to join her in her venture, whereas Alice only had one. 
And Alice had a much more difficult time with unscrupulous partners initially, and that's what led her finally to her son, which was successful. Um, and four, uh, the fourth difference, method of promotion. I'm sorry, Ooh, that was it, yeah. Yeah, and Alice ended up having, um, yeah, I'm sorry, method of promotion. Because she had the capital, Lydia, Lydia could advertise in national publications and she mailed her products. Whereas Alice advertised in regional newspapers and traveled door to door to a limited area. Uh, that limited area included all of North Carolina, the southern portion of Virginia, and the northern portion of South Carolina. Um, those, those travel journals that I mentioned earlier from the last 13 years of her life were just amazing. She went everywhere from the mountains of North Carolina to the Outer Banks, up into Portsmouth, Virginia, down into Spartanburg, South Carolina, uh, and made her way through the countryside there. She would go to a county, uh, hire a man and a wagon, and go door to door selling this and her music. She also sold it through druggists, and um, the druggist here in town that sold it Wooten, Wooten Drugs, sold it here in town. The final difference that I just mentioned about traveling door to door is one that I think Alice would have had no other way. On several occasions, she wrote fondly of how her medicine and music brought her, quote, nearer the people. I think the preface to Alice's autobiographical account of her unique career, which is included in its entirety in my book, c communicates well Alice's love for mankind and also for what was perhaps the strongest motivation for undertaking her career, that being her family. She writes, the interest of many people has been awakened in regard to my work. How did I ever happen to think of it? How did I start to take hold of it? Why did I choose such a life? And similar questions have been asked me hundreds of times. This little book is intended as an answer to all. For 15 years, I have led a drummer's life, have come into contact with all manner of mankind, high and low, rich and poor, patricians and plebeians, knights and cowards. And it must be an opaque nature that could not, in turn, learn a lesson from each as they came along. Every conversation, every incident narrated is an actual fact, given exactly as it occurred. In no sense of the word is it an advertisement, but an account of my work, concentrated into its title the chivalry of man as exemplified in the life of Mrs. Joe Person, dedicated to my beloved children for whom I have lived and learned. In closing, I present some options for further investigation into Alice, her music, and her medicine, as well as one last reading. The first option is, of course, the uh, biography of Alice written by Chris Gertzen and myself. ECU owns three lending copies of it, one here in Lopez, one at Joyner, and one in the Music Library. And it can also be purchased on uh, Amazon.com. Um, let me make a, a, a little comment about the title, Good Medicine and Good Music. Um, that came to me as I read uh, um, 18, I believe, 89 or 1898 announcement of one of Alice's trips to Greenville, you know, they published everything in the papers then, everybody coming into town on the morning train, and indeed that's what this said. Um, this morning, Mrs. Joe Person came in on the morning train, it talked a little bit about her, and then it closed by saying, good medicine and good music have made her name a household word. And I said, there's the title of my book, Good Medicine and Good Music. The second option is Joyner Library's digital Alice Person collection, which contains the digital versions of many of the materials contained in the Alice Morgan Person collection, housed in Joyner's rare books and manuscripts collection. Here you can see and study things like letters to and from Alice, as well as photos of Alice and her family. You can also see every page of Alice's sheet music and listen to it at the same time, just as we did earlier in my lecture. I have handouts with all the information you will need to access these resources, so please be sure to pick one up on your way out if you're interested. Finally, a reading from my book that I think beautifully sums up Alice's life. One of the newspaper obituaries that appeared after Alice's passing in 1913 indicated she was, quote, a woman of peculiar force. 
I was fascinated by this choice of words, and as I pondered them in relation to what I had learned about Alice's life throughout my research, the following epilogue emerged. Alice Morgan Person considered herself a toiler who made sledgehammer bows day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year to win the fight. Alice's sledgehammer, however, contained extra measures of strength, ingenuity, and spirituality that caused her to rise above other toilers. Her extra measure of strength bolstered her faith in the medicine's potential despite the fact her husband discouraged her from even attempting to market it. With well-placed blows, she successfully distributed it far and wide and used the proceeds to feed, clothe, and educate her family. As though that was not enough, she ingeniously combined this activity with a seemingly disparate one, i.e. music, to form a unique synthesis. While this combination separated Alice from the crowd, her spirituality lifted her above it. She considered her life's work to be a calling not of her choosing, talents thrust on her by a higher power, which also made them a mission by leaving her with no other way to support the family she dearly loved. This purposeful resignation is the peculiar force for which Alice has been and will continue to be remembered. I chose the words purposeful resignation because she frequently wrote in her brief autobiography of the, of the story of the medicine that there were just things that happened and she just would cross her hands and go with the flow. And then she would react. She knew how to react. And she just was not going to get in the way of what was already predetermined. And I think that made her a very unique person, someone we all have a lot to learn from. Thank you for coming today. Any questions? <laughs> uh, Harry, you made a comment on Dixie that I don't remember. So I'm going to see if, we, if you remember it and we can get it on tape. The, the family story is when she, after she signed the contract and started marketing the pianos and she went to Atlanta and she went to Dallas, she would play one of the pieces out of the published books, but she knew where her crowd was and who her crowd was. She played Dixie between every intervening piece to keep the crowd increasing. Okay, thank you. Oh, and one, one other thing David didn't mention, and this has uh, actually been documented, and David has it in the book, she is credited with having the first two piano recordings done by RCA Victor, uh, Thomas Edison. I don't know about the first two. She did record she, with them. I don't know if they were the first. First two. That okay. Well, that's done. the family, you know. But, yeah. The family's going to liberalize that. You have to realize <laughs> that when I grew up, this lady was a saint. And I grew up in a family where the women in my family did all the accomplishments. The men were basically just there. <laughs> they played supporting and child producing roles, and that was basically it. <laughs> Yeah, she did record for them, and um, uh, they were what they called personal recordings, and are, they are listed among in their catalog as things that they that they recorded. But they were, I think, they called white labels, um, so they think they certainly no longer exist. And this was for RCA. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask. Uh, <clears throat> Do, do you know if anyone has been interested enough to take these ingredients that uh, seem to impact scrofula and actually analyze these herbs to see what chemicals are there? Now, some of the studies that my co-author, oh, should I, I'm sorry. Oh, so, some of the um, studies that my co-author referenced might have said those things. I don't know that he found anything. At least he did not report that. Um, but certainly they must have talked in some of those about the chemicals yeah. that were well, there. Well, I, I don't want to debunk her remedy. <laughs> uh, and I'll point out that uh, phytotherapy is still quite an active uh, uh, subset of, of the healing arts, even here in North Carolina. And I've attended classes on phytotherapy. However, most of the herbs and plants they use, there, there's absolutely no scientific evidence as to why they work. It's all hearsay um, and uh, anecdotal. Now, the other question I would ask, uh, how do we know those people that had enlarged lymph nodes in their neck really had scrofula or something this else? This is true. We done? This, that's what I'm saying. They only, had, they only went by, by symptoms. That's so. right. <laughs> However, I, I don't uh, impugn her work, and I would call to your attention that 
as Melissa knows here, I'm a great fan of ancient Egypt. The ancient Egyptians had all of our, uh, not all, but virtually all of our antibiotics. They didn't know what they had, but for example, they knew if they had a wound that wasn't healing up, they were great trauma surgeons, and if, if they knew they had a wound that wasn't healing up, they'd get a piece of molded bread and put on the, bind it up on the wound, and it would do magical things. Well, obviously what they had was penicillin. They didn't know that. Also, they used honey a lot, and even in, in this decade, there have been scientific papers written on the uh, antibiotic content of honey. They, they knew, the Egyptians knew that honey also was even better than molded bread. But in honey, you find the, uh, the keflins, you find streptomycin. Now, that would have worked on scrofula. And, uh, and she actually, for children, she recommended that you um, put honey, mix oh, honey yes. with it well, to sweeten she, it. She was on the right, she was on the right she track She didn't know what there. she was doing. But. And, and, and it is of interest <laughs> that um, it was around 2006 or somewhere along there, a group of biochemists in, uh, I believe it was the Netherlands, did publish a paper on their analysis of honey. Now, they looked at honey from a broad spectrum of countries across the world, and they did indeed find these antibiotics in honey. They, they also found that the honey that was produced in New Zealand was the most potent. So, <laughs> What blossoms? Do oh, I don't know. know. <laughs> I, I, they, Certainly they, they just knew the origin was in New Zealand, but I do not know what plant to, the honey came from. So while a, a lot of phytotherapy is hearsay and anecdote and really not a whole lot of science behind it, uh, I don't think we can uh, completely uh, eliminate uh, that as, uh, uh, as, as being valid. Some of these children may have had some other problem that caused their lymph nodes to enlarge others. And problems. that it did affect. But if she put honey in there, it may be the honey that was curing it rather than what she had. <laughs> yeah. Because we, we know that honey contains streptomycin. The dozens of testimonial letters and things, yeah. and I, I just really feel that Alice was someone who, who would not yeah. have, have invented these things. Um, you have to wonder if she was just lucky that circumstances came together to cause these healings, or if there might have been some kind of of validity in some way, and that's why I, I'm not going to say that um, there were those people who, who definitely knew that they were pulling the wool over the eyes of people. There was one, one producer of a, of a pill or a tablet, a capsule that had a piece of paper rolled up in it so that it would look like you had killed worms when you would investigate your stool. So that you'd have these dead worms. If you had worms, you would take this medicine. They knew exactly what they were doing. So, yeah. <clears throat> Many uh, European herbal elixirs survive today as cordials, and I was just wondering if there's any uh, record of what this tastes like. Someone else asked that earlier. I don't think it would have tasted so very good. I can tell you, because the family was liberally dosed with the remedy all the way up until the closing of the plant in 45. Right. I, I missed it by seven years. I was born in 52, <laughs> or I would have been dosed with it, too, I'm sure, for everything. The other thing too is, and David talked about it, with the letter with the little nine-year-old girl, nine bottles of anything. I'm wondering if what it was is it just made the body so, like, you know, it cleaned it to such a point that the germs had to leave, you know, you just say. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, we don't, we, we don't, we're assuming this youngster had scrofula. She may or may not. Uh, she had some swelling in her neck here, but swelling in the neck of a youngster is pretty common from caused by organism and other conditions. Well, now, the nine-year-old girl on the letter, though, her and legs were. She, her legs, and yeah. she little pieces of bone coming out of her legs. But that, that was a different, girl. okay, okay, yeah, that yeah. one, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. you, you see, what we don't know if they had done nothing, would that child have gotten well anyway? Right. They gave her the medicine and, yeah. uh, and she got better, but that doesn't prove cause and effect. Um, I'll give you another interesting association that I've noticed, and, and I don't say this is cause and effect, I just tell you, but as the price of gasoline gets to $4 a gallon, our business on the medical examiner service goes down. I figure they can't afford bullets and gasoline, so they choose the gasoline. Again, because I'm not certain how much of this is getting on the tape, what Harry said 
uh, it, a little bit a while ago was that he didn't he he was not dosed with it and wishes now that he'd asked his father what what it tastes like. Uh, so there may uh, we don't know if if. David, if you eventually find somebody who has actually said they had taken it, the ask, please re try to ask them what if if they remember what the yeah, taste yeah, is. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I can answer that not about not about this compound, but uh, he he used the word old a while ago, and he did it very respectfully. Thank you so much, because I'm probably the oldest guy in the room. And uh, in my childhood, these preparations were very common. I can tell you, they were pretty foul tasting. <laughs> so um, I, I imagine that this compound, whatever, it, uh, all, all of those ingredients, I'm sure it had a, uh, a pretty unique flavor, let's put it that way. For, for the sores, I, I didn't say this earlier, but um, for conditions that had skin eruptions and sores, in addition to the oral medicine, she had a wash. Oh, um, sure. Yeah, and then, and but when you read her instructions for that, it's all it's all about cleanliness. So probably the fact that they were washing it out regularly and applying, and she says, you know, when you when you wipe it out, throw those rags away, and get other ones that have been thoroughly laundered and dried and and everything, you know. So this is just a matter of cleanliness. Of course, they were probably going to be healed more quickly. Anybody else? I've got one for David. David, given the fact that these were all herbs that she had to gather, I mean, have you found anything in any of the records that indicated she had gotten anybody to garden plots of any of this stuff or any? I mean, I, mm -hmm. I can just see her wandering out in the woods with two or three people and right. picking this stuff up, which is also going to limit production. I, I would think at some point you would have gone, I need some sarsaparilla, you know, an acre or two of it somewhere at least, you know. Well, you know, back then you're dealing with, with nearly virgin forests and things, so I'm sure there was much more to be found, and you know, not the amount of development that there is today, but um, Michael Boyce, who, who donated that large collection of materials to ECU, did tell me that uh, he recalled his father told him that uh, his father and sisters would, would go, um, his father's father would have been Rufus Morgan, the one who took over production of the medicine for Alice and who assisted her all through her uh, later part of her life. Um, they would spend whole days going on trips through the country to gather the stuff. So. So grandmother might have been slave labor. I had no <laughs> idea how that would be good. <laughs> there you go. Well, actually, yes, she was. That I did find in a letter. Um, she, she wrote in a letter to someone else that the children were mad at her because they hated making the medicine because it stained their hands. So. I think we're, anybody, other questions? Well, in that case, thank you very much, Dave. You're very welcome.